including that in part of the Senate's version of the operating budget? Well, the, the House does what the House does, um, you know, and uh, having been in the House, uh, things can get caught up, and it's very difficult to make long-term fiscal policy decisions uh, when uh, the um, issue uh, can get uh, quite emotional. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of downward pressure. Many of them said that they wanted to lead by example, but to, uh, to do what they did, I think, uh, uh, and I believe that they would have to try to live on $57 a day down here is, is in my view, unrealistic. And um, uh, those decisions, I think, are better made by uh, the way that our salaries are, are decided by a salary commission uh, because we are so closely uh, um, tied to it. We're, it should be a, a more of an independent uh, a body that uh, looks at that and makes those type of recommendations. So I'm not inclined to uh, change uh, the public policy regarding uh, per diem particularly when it was so, I would say, so massive of a reduction um, uh, to their salary. And what type of uh, individual would that policy attract to a public office? That's a big question. Well, it's a huge question. I mean, uh, what that essentially limits it to is the destitute and the wealthy. Um, the reality of it is you, you can't live on $50 a day in Juneau, Alaska. And I have had several House members that voted yes ask how we're going to um, help solve that little situation that they had on the floor where they played chicken and all lost. The reality of it is I'll ask those reporters in the room from out of town, how many are not compensated for your living costs while you're in Juneau? I don't see any hands. I mean, that's what per diem is. It covers your costs when you're away from home. And some of us have managed our, our um, per diem to be some of the lowest in the legislature. Some, many of us don't take it when we don't need to take it. When we're in even the neighboring town um, where we, some of us have to drive two and a half hours, don't take per diem if we're not forced to stay overnight. But I bring my family down here. I want family serving. I want people from all walks of life being able to serve. And limiting it, limiting it to the two extremes brings two types of people down here, and it's just poor policy. So playing chicken on the floor is not good policy. We need people to be thoughtful and considerate. If they want to limit it to what it costs for the average um, to live and work in Juneau, Alaska, then that's one thing. But there is no consideration on that daily cost. And uh, they played a game and all lost. So I, I'm, it's not my job to bail them out. Um, I know many are expecting the Senate to do that. We'll, uh, we'll process through the budget, and we'll do what's right for the Senate. And um, the House can do what's right for the House. Other questions? Becky? Becky Barth, the Associated Press. Senator Mitchell, you mentioned if there's not movement on the other side on some major issues, the Senate would move. Aside from tax credits, what are still the remaining um, major issues in, in, in the caucus's opinion? Well, the number one issue, again, I talk about the 95% plan, and that was Senate Bill 26. And we've spent the last two and a half years working on that bill. We know that bill very well. We processed it in all different situations, and uh, it's we're going to continue with our reductions where it's appropriate while still meeting all those uh, little requirements of that little blue book I talk about that's the Constitution. I mean, it costs money to run government, and you can't undercut to the point where you can't deliver quality critical services. In the DPS budget, we added five trooper positions back in without increasing the bottom line. I mean, it, it takes some creativity and it takes some knowledge of finance and economics to be able to deliver those services without running up the price tag. We've been able to do that. Had the Senate cuts stuck over the last couple of years, we would have no problem with Senate Bill 26 actually filling the gap. But as it gets to the other body, we have to compromise and um, work out those differences. So again, I've talked about the 95% solution. If we get an uptick of a few dollars on the price of oil or one of those fields come online, we're balanced. 
and the Senate is willing to talk about other legislation that will help in that way as well. But if we don't see what we need to see coming across the finish line from the House, um, we have legislation waiting that will uh, be heading the other way. Rains with KTVA back here. Um, so you mentioned that um, you're, if you don't start to see things coming across from the House, um, the Senate has legislation to introduce. I'm wondering, are you referring to SB 26, which they haven't scheduled a hearing on yet? Is the Senate concerned about the pace that that bill is moving in House? Well, I was referring to all the big policy calls. Um, we talked about tax credits just a few moments ago, and. Um, we are concerned about 26. Um, we, we don't know if they can move a uh, one bill that they have that deals with both. Um, we're two-thirds of the way through. We're still on a 90-day schedule here. I mean, if we have to run over a few days, that's all well and good if it takes longer for the House to process legislation. But our schedule is for 90 days, so we are going to make those policy calls and leave them adequate time to process those bills. Um, that come across from the Senate, but we would like to see some motion and some courtesy on hearing those bills, and uh, even though they're tough policy calls, we'd like to see them on the floor. There's, it, there's critical legislation that has to pass this year, or we are out of savings, out of money, and then we start making, I don't want to play chicken with the big policy calls. Um, Tra traditionally, I would say that uh, when a, a bill passes one body first, uh, that becomes the vehicle. And I, I guess um, even though a House Bill 115 uh, deals with um, our issue in 26, that has a, another item in it uh, on income tax. So I would say that uh, it would be better for the Senate's view that they separate the two issues. I know that there's some uh, single subject rules that are of concern to the Senate, and it would, from my view, we should follow the, the traditions and uh, the House should deal with uh, Senate Bill 26 as the vehicle to address the, the dividend uh, rewrite. The, the, sorry, just have one more question. The House is uh, focusing this week on the oil tax legislation. Um, is that bill HB 111 dead on arrival in the Senate? Well, I, I'm not going to make the statement that anything is dead on arrival. It's our responsibility to process it, just like it's our responsibility to hear every side of every issue that's represented in the legislature. We're, we're going to give those bills a um, fair hearing and evaluate them and change them if we need to. Remember, 247 was an HB, not an SB. So we will work, work through those issues, and we will be fair and transparent in our process. We will hear every amendment by the minority. Um, we will make them a part of this process. We want every Alaskan to know that their representative is being fairly heard. So you will see us process those bills as well. Uh, we would like adequate time. Um, so we'd like, if, if they are able to pass them out, they need to get, get on the ball, get them passed out. We hope to see a budget this week, or uh, we will start with ours. Um, but we're essentially ready to go on the budget. We're, we have legislation for the other major issues. We'd like to hear some House bills. Let them be the vehicle in certain cases. But uh, so far, we've not had that opportunity. One point that uh, I was expecting questions on this morning, so I'll go ahead and answer it anyway, is that uh, one major difference between the House budget and the, the Senate budget is that the Senate budget, uh, when, when we pass it over, is going to require a three-quarter vote. Um, the spending level uh, that the governor has and the House has on uh, spending close to 9% of the permanent fund earnings reserve account, or when you calculate the whole permanent fund itself, sp uh, spending uh, close to 9% in one year, uh, I think um, does damage to the, to the fund, and uh, the Senate's won't be that high. So uh, in order to uh, address that and save the integrity of the permanent fund, that draw has to be reduced. And once you reduce that, uh, then 
uh, we will be required to use funds from the CBR, uh, which requires mm -hmm. access to that fund. So that is going to be a major difference in the way that the Senate is approaching the budget compared to the governor and the House, and it's primarily to protect the integrity of the permanent fund. Yeah. Um, Matt Hurst of the Alaska Dispatch News. I, I guess I would just follow up with that question, Senator Hoffman. Um, I mean, isn't actually the House proposing to draw less than the Senate is proposing to draw with SB 26 because their draw is over two years and there wasn't a few of you draw on the permanent fund last year? Well, when, when you look at the, the, the numbers um, in, the, uh, um, in the draw, they plan on taking um, uh, Two point one point, uh, I think it's one point nine billion dollars, and and uh, put it into the into a fund, and then take out uh, one point two nine and put it into the education fund. Um, so along with the the regular draw, um, so there's there's draws from FY17 and FY18 in in the one bill, and when you look at combining those two, it is close to eight percent. That's actual, actual expenditures out of the fund this year. So 26 um, respects all of the key issues that the Senate was, was looking for in that bill. I mean, we, we protect the corpus. In fact, we grow the corpus faster than any other plan. The end of year balance at FY26 for the permanent fund was 70 billion. Not, no other plan reaches almost 71 billion. All compared apples to apples, we uh, protect the dividend, which was important to us. Instead of a high dividend for four or five or six years, we um, protect an average or just below average dividend in perpetuity. Um, and we, again, it's the 95% solution on an adequate draw that um, covers the cost of this government under most conditions. So we we're successful in that bill. We hope they uh, view it favorably and hope we get it passed and we can get on other business. As we know, nothing else matters in this building if that bill doesn't pass. We simply can't fill that gap. So if they like the bill and need to feel like they need to make some minor changes to get it passed, that's all well and good. Um, we're willing to talk about the other policy issues once they get that bill across the finish line. One more. one more question. Andrew. Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Uh, last Friday, uh, Representative Seaton characterized SB 26 as only a partial solution, and he, he said that uh, uh, there really needs to be a diversity of revenue sources, um, so that there would have to be a title change to SB 26 uh, if uh, it was to include a, a income tax. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on uh, his emphasizing uh, a uh, diversity of revenue sources under the, as part of the discussion of uh, the permanent fund draw? Well, I, I would have to say that uh, Senator Machicki already answered that. You know, you look at the, the, the notes on uh, Senate Bill 26, on the out years in uh, 2023, We've had testimony um, that says, for all practical purposes, without any reduction.